I'm David Land. This is the road to 100,000 subscribers. I'm about to give you my account of the race without the express written consent of NASCAR Broadcasting. And no, I did not enjoy today's broadcast. So Ricky Stenhouse Jr. is a Daytona 500 champion. And that is our Coca-Cola move of the race. Fantastic for a Coca-Cola racing family member, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. And a special shout out to Wendy's for making sure that I was not hungry through the entirety of the Daytona 500. And not only that, they gave us the special privilege because of the Wendy's burger on board of the day of missing Ryan Blaney losing a tire and Alex Bowman moments from disaster saving a car. We never got a replay of that, but at least we got the Wendy's on board. It was fantastic. So thanks to Wendy's for that. Special shout out as well to Bush Light because I certainly wouldn't have been able to get through those couple of overtimes where we smashed up hundreds of thousands of dollars of race cars without the help of Bush Light. Head for the mountains of Bush. And it, did you know, if you text a number on the fourth lap of every fourth part of the race, but make sure you do it when we're not in commercial, otherwise you'll miss the lap that ends in four, you can enter the Bush 401k sweepstakes, where if you text Bush's number and give up your personal information, possibly to be texted and harassed by Bush Beer with advertising for the rest of your human adult life, maybe you could win $50,000 for your retirement. Thanks to Bush 401k. And those wrecks, I'll tell you what, those were spectacular, weren't they? Rather than give you an update on any of the driver's conditions that were involved in them, we're going to give this wreck the Goodyear skid mark of the race award. Goodyear, driving winners since the birth of NASCAR. Did I tell you that NASCAR is 75 years old? Well, you know, you don't actually want to watch any more of our NASCAR racing product, but let's show you the same NASCAR 75 ad 75 times. So we'll advertise to you to watch more NASCAR, well, more NASCAR commercials. Now the rest of this video will be brought to you with limited commercial interruption by our partners at Toyota. And now, Let's go Toyota, all out. Okay, so let's let's be positive here for a second because there are some positive things to talk about. I thought the first 180 laps, what we actually did get to see on television, because if there ever was a race that I'm sure the 150,000 people who were in Daytona watched and who actually watched at home are just completely different races, this was it. Um, because uh, from what I saw... At the beginning of the race, it was pretty good. In fact, without the stages, I think we would have had one of the longest green flag runs we've seen in a very long time at the Daytona 500. And it's frankly unfortunate, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, that there are those stage cautions because I think this could have been a very intriguing race from a strategy standpoint. In some ways, it was towards the end of the race. So I've got to give it props for that. Oftentimes, we see that wreck at the beginning of the Daytona 500 which uh, makes the whole rest of the race quite a slog and maybe uh, makes us ignore some of those commercials throughout the broadcast. Uh, but those green flag runs certainly broken up for the TV audience. Uh, the highlight, I'm going to be positive about Fox here for a second because I thought their pre-race show was definitely interrupted by less commercials. I'll tell you that, first of all. But I thought they did a really good job, actually. Um, they did a really good job of, of talking about the drivers, telling stories, kind of uh, not only telling the stories, but then discussing those stories and expanding upon them uh, with Jamie McMurray and Clint Boyer and Tony Stewart. I thought that was great. And I also got to give a shout out once again, because I'm going to keep doing it every time I talk about a race that he's in the booth. Tony Stewart is a damned genius at TV. I wish every NASCAR race had Tony Stewart in the booth. I just know that Tony Stewart doesn't want to be in the booth for every NASCAR race. He's got a full-time NHRA ride now. And finally, to finish out the good, I will talk about Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Because while the circumstances in which he won this Daytona 500 are certainly questionable, and we're going to question them here in a bit, 
I think that Ricky Stenhouse, you know, just all by itself winning this Daytona 500 is great because I think he was, I think he was in great position last year to win the race. Frankly, he should have been. He was wrecked really through no uh, fault of his own. He got pushed, I believe, if I remember correctly. It might have been Brad Kay, actually, that wrecked him last year. So really, uh, Ricky's kind of been knocking on the door for a while at these, uh, uh, I, didn't, I keep wanting to say restrictor plate tracks. I'm going to say restrictor plate track, and you can just correct me in the comments. Uh, at these restrictor plate tracks for a while, particularly uh, at the Daytona 500, uh, he's always been fast at them, but he's been, uh, as we know, kind of gained this reputation of being the guy that causes the big one. Well, that aggression finally paid off today, where he won NASCAR's biggest prize. So... I'm happy for Ricky Stenhouse. He's a dirt track guy, open wheel guy actually coming up. It's good to see him. His celebration was awesome. He ran out of fuel, uh, seeing how uh, close they they cut it with uh, uh, a 500-mile race distance, which went 530 miles. I thought his celebration, uh, once again, another NASCAR driver rips off Elio Castroneves, but he at least added his own spin to climbing the fence by doing pull-ups on the fence. And I just sitting there going, and I think some people misinterpreted my tweet when I said that was sketchy. It's, it's not sketchy that I think he's going to pull the fence down. It's that if you fall from the fence, that's quite a, uh, it's quite a fall. But uh, I think this is good for Ricky Stenhouse. Like, and it's good for JTG Darty Racing, uh, a smaller team in NASCAR. Yes, they have a charter, but they did have to re uh, reduce uh, their footprint in NASCAR because they only had one charter recently. Uh, they had to let Chris Buescher go. Of course, he was one of the dominant cars earlier in this race, um, not able to to get it across the line. It's kind of weird how the RFK racing team kind of fell apart there towards the end. I guess they didn't get their fuel strategy right for a 500-mile race that went 530 miles. Okay, the part that you're probably here for, the bad, the bad of the broadcast. Um, and it was the broadcast, and it was the commercials. And I saw a stat that I guess... The amount of commercial breaks in this race were the same uh, up until the halfway point as the 2007 Daytona 500. Now, I was, what, 14 years old in 2007? I can't exactly remember how I reacted uh, to that many commercials then, but I can tell you how it felt when I'm 29. It sucked. It was one of the most disjointed broadcasts I've ever seen if I'm being frank and honest. It was unbelievable that I thought it was 10-lap intervals. As it turns out, I think someone was doing the math on Twitter. It ended up being around an average that we saw about eight laps of green flag action for every commercial break. Ridiculous. And, and I know, I know, you're going to say, whoa, David, they, they have to make money. Oh, you can't just watch it for free. I guess not, but there's another series that does no commercials. We'll talk about that in just a second. I think the commercial breaks would not have been as egregious if it wouldn't have been that half of the time that they were actually on air, it seemed they were doing the sponsor segment. You heard me lampoon it earlier in this video. I mean, they would come back from commercial, they'd go full screen on some dumb Coca-Cola thing, and, and they missed things. I mean, they missed Bubba Wallace get turned into the wall. That was a very key moment for the driver who finished second in the Daytona 500 last year. A driver who has quite a following, both positive and negative. He's a very polarizing driver. That was a huge story. A huge story that they just missed. Uh, they missed one of the wrecks. They cut to commercial. And rather than what they have used to have done in the past, uh, they didn't uh, eject out of that break. They just kept it side by side and just let the wreck roll. I mean, why even hire Mike Joy if you don't have him call any of the race? You know, if you just have, if you've hired Mike Joy to read ads, well, <laughs> I guess, I mean, a fool in his money as we speak, as we say. But I mean, here's the thing, man. I think F1 has come in and changed the game in the U.S. It's no longer acceptable, I think, uh, to racing fans to have this level of interruption by commercials. It was r ridiculous. And watching a Formula One race commercial free, or even if you watched the Soccer World Cup, and I understand a lot of NASCAR fans are going to be in the comments, um, you know, saying, well, I don't watch that stuff. And it's going to be like, okay, you don't. But a lot of other people do. 
And that number's growing. And it's young people, too. So you have got to think about the future of the sport. How many young people turn this damn thing on, watched about two uh, commercial breaks length of commercials, and said, eh, back to Fortnite. You're not thinking about those things, are you? The other thing that I think is ridiculous, just absolutely ridiculous, is the fact that we're caught. We should not call this the Daytona 500 anymore. The name has no meaning. It should be the Daytona season opener or the big race at Daytona. The Daytona Bowl. There we go. The Clash at Daytona. Maybe we'll call it that. Um, Because this race went 212 laps. The longest Daytona 500 ever. 200 or 530 miles. 212 laps. Let me ask you a question. And I want you to answer this down in the comment section below. If Kyle Busch had won under caution, was it a better finish than Ricky Stenhouse winning under caution? Really think about that for a second. Because I know what Kyle Busch thought, and I get it, he's biased, but it sure sounded like he'd watched a previous video of mine in which I said, hey, if 1998 Daytona 500 happened today, Jeremy Mayfield probably dumps Dale Earnhardt on the restart, and Jeremy Mayfield wins the 1998 Daytona 500. And how would history look at that? Well, I hate to break it to you. Jeremy Mayfield just won the Daytona 500, not Dale Earnhardt. That's what happened. The driver who won or was leading at regulation, the 500-mile race distance, probably would have been better for the sport if he'd won. Just going to throw that out there. Nothing against Ricky Stenhouse because he earned it based on the rules as they are written right now. Uh, but Kyle Busch was the leader at the Daytona 500. Um, and it's a shame, too, because the overtime is just so silly now, especially with the package they're running. And that's something I think we really need to talk about, because I think a lot of people you know, saw cars running in a pack close together, and they just completely turn their brain off because they don't know what they're looking at. What you have now for the majority of the race is you have the choo-choo train, but now it's two lanes of choo-choo train. Um, I, I I cannot remember a Daytona 500 pretty much ever where essentially the top 20 positions did not change for like, what, the first 10, 11, 12 laps until um, Kyle Larson got pushed way out by Joey Logano and Christopher Bell uh, swooped in there and took the lead. Again, a moment missed by Fox, by the way. Um, the, the, the passing is almost non-existent. Uh, you have to shove cars and that's where we really see these overtimes come into play is that, you know, you have to be so aggressive shoving cars. There's no room for error. I mean, they, they're, they're locked. I mean, they're literally welded together bumper to bumper. Handling almost means nothing. I mean, how many drivers didn't take any tires at the end of the race? That's because they don't need them. The, the cars don't fall off enough. I mean, you look at those classic Daytona 500s, you know, you had comers and goers. You had cars falling off the pace, you know, you had handling be a factor. It's never going to change and I'm never going to stop complaining about it uh, because that's not really, you know, it's not really what I want to watch. I know maybe the majority want to watch the demolition derby at the end of the race. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's silly and it's just, it makes it disjointed too. disjointed and unnatural would be the way I I put it. I think the last two stints of the race before we really got into the overtime nonsense was, was good actually, um, where you actually had a green flag pit stop and you had um, drivers make mistakes. Like Denny Hamlin completely threw away his Daytona 500 by not pitting with enough cars. Uh, I thought that was interesting. And even after the Stuart Haas big one, where you know three of their their cars all stacked up and they all crashed um, because the closing rates were so ridiculous. Um, you know, even even the next green flag up until the Suarez uh, spin. I thought was exciting. You know, that, that was like, wow, Hey, the Daytona 500 is back. I remember this race. I watched it as a kid. And then it turned into the big, uh, crash fest demolition derby. Uh, isn't it funny that, that Jimmy Johnson has caused green, white checkers in both the Indy 500 and the Daytona 500 within 365 days. Uh, the final thing I just wanted to complain about was how quick <laughs> they threw the yellow when Daniel Suarez got spun by Jimmy Johnson. Um, I mean, he was like, loose and they threw the yellow i mean i looked up at that screen and that yellow yellow light was on and suarez was car was starting to point straight i'm like yep this is what they want so i mean they got what they wanted um 
But uh, you know, it's the yearly it's the yearly thing at this point. I mean, it, it I don't think it's going to change. I, I you know you look at the drivers. I don't think they particularly like this stuff either. I mean, watch some of the interviews, uh, including Chase Elliott talking about how many cars they're going to wreck, and you know, it's a big it's a big show, and so that's what it is now. And we'll be discussing it on my podcast on Monday. Uh, so I hope you guys will tune in for that. Thank you guys so much for watching. No more commercial interruptions because I'll see you in the next video.